From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Lieutenant Barry here. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. You're stepping on toes, Johnny boy. Who's now? Dr. Victor Palmquist. Here you had a chat with him. Just how do you chat with a clan? Whatever it was, he was very unhappy about it. He called you? Yeah, very snide, too. Said if we had any more questions, to leave him alone and call his lawyers and to keep unauthorized people away from him. Meaning me? Meaning you. Well, what's he worried about? You've already got his wife's killer in jail, haven't you? Everybody buys that but you, Johnny. You said it before. I'm a hard sale. Meet me for lunch. I'll try to sell you. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Expense account continued. Item three, one dollar even. Taxi to the Barclay for lunch with Lieutenant Berry. But let me backtrack for a minute. Coming down in the hotel elevator, I kept thinking over what the lieutenant had said. And I disagreed completely. I wasn't a hard sale. It's just that I wasn't an early sale. There were too many angles to the death of Mrs. Palmquist. Too many things I didn't know yet. I got proof of that the minute I stepped outside the hotel. The white cad sedan parked directly across the street contained a real interesting combination of people. Eric Palmquist, the doctor's son, and Steffi Lund, the doctor's nurse. The moment they saw me, they did what every amateur sleuth does. They drove away as fast as possible, thereby becoming just as conspicuous as a second nose. By the time I reached the Barclay, Lieutenant Berry had ordered for both of us. You don't like it, order something else, but it's the best they got. Matter of fact, it looks pretty good. Now, as I was saying... Yeah, yeah, so Palmquist nurse and his kid are an item. You waiting for me to look impressed? You get up out of the wrong side this morning, Lieutenant. Look, I don't like the smell of this deal any more than you do, but what does it all add up to? You're sent out here to look into a possible killing. Which happens? Victim, Mrs. Palmquist. So an ex-convict sits in a cell accused of the murder. The accuser and witness, the dead woman's husband. The con insists he's been framed, that the husband is a killer. But the husband is well alibied, bringing it down to the setup known as ex-con versus respected citizen. You know there's more to it than that. Don't give me lessons, Johnny. You think you've come up with one thing we don't already know about? I got checkouts going on the doctor, his nurse, his son, everybody within shooting distance of this thing. Don't get any ideas we're asleep down at the hall. All right, all right. Give me a little fill, huh? Who? Palmquist's nurse, Steffi Lund. Nice kid, never been in trouble. At least we couldn't find any. What about the boy, Eric Palmquist? Typical rich doctor's son. Kind of wild, sensitive, gambles, but Papa can afford it. Also hits the booze too much for a kid that young. What about the doctor's alibi, Laura Considine? Yeah, no, I should have skipped that one. Your eyes look like they're whistling. Isn't that awful? At my age, too. <clears throat> All right, Johnny, she's clean. By the way, where does she live? There's a big house in Long Beach. Why? No doctors there? It's still a free country. I know people whose doctors live in Patterson, New Jersey. Points. Oh, almost forgot. I got the lab report on that anonymous note that started this thing. Anything? Untraceable. No prints. Cheap paper that can be bought anywhere. And the letters were cut from a dozen different magazines. Didn't tell us a thing. What do you mean it didn't? What? It told us someone was going to try to collect on a policy. We knocked it around a little while longer, getting no place in particular. Then suddenly I was being paged for a telephone call. Barry's raised eyebrows were eloquent. They made me feel like one of those would-be movie stars who have themselves paged in the brown derby so that other would-be stars will know they're there. I had a funny notion about who might be calling, so I told the waiter I'd taken in the booth out front and left Lieutenant Barry by himself. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad I found you. Oh? This is... This is Steffi Lund, Dr. Palmquist's nurse. Well, the day's picking up. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't interrupt your lunch. You see, I called your hotel and they told me where you'd gone. I'm sorry. Well, I don't did... apologize, Steffi. A working girl who drives around in a beautiful white Cadillac doesn't have to, you know. I... I'll explain about that. Why should you owe me any explanation? Please, Mr. Dollar. I've got to see you right away. It's terribly important. Mr. Dollar. Where are you? I'm at Dr. Palmquist's office. Can you come here now, right away? Okay, I'll be right over. And please... Don't 
bring anyone along with you, will you? However you want it, you're calling the shots. Oh, thank you. And hurry, please. Expense account item four, citation for speeding, $25. The carbon copy reads 63 miles per hour in a 35 zone. You ever try to talk an L.A.-type cop out of a ticket? It's ridiculous. He's always a big, good-looking guy who listens seriously while you alibi, but never stops writing. Then he smiles, calls you sir, and hands you the ticket. I couldn't beef about it, though. Two reasons. One, I deserved it. And two, if I hadn't been stopped, I'd never have realized I was being tailed. Because the tail knew what he was doing. A heavy-set, thuggy-looking fellow in a black 51 sedan. He circled the block twice while I was getting the ticket was right back on me as I started out again. He was still there as I pulled up in front of Dr. Palmquist's office. But he was smart enough to ride on by without even looking at me. I waited to see if he'd come around the block again. He didn't. That's a switch. When you called me a few minutes ago, you no, said... No, you're mistaken. I didn't well, call now, you. wait just a I minute. I didn't call you. Don't her you words understand? were deliberate, emphatic, you. but her eyes were suddenly doing the real talking, signaling desperately into the room behind her, trying to tell me that she wasn't alone. But I wasn't the only one who caught the signal. Get away from the door, Stevie. Come in, you. Did you hear me? I said come in. Eric, please. Hello, Eric. What seems to be the trouble around here? That's far enough. Oh, now, come on. Why don't you put that thing down? Your family's had enough misery with 38s. He's darling. Do what he says. Why did you call him, Steffi? Why? Because somebody's got to help you because of what you're going through and what it's doing to you. Eric, I can't stand any more of it. You're half out of your mind with fear now. Listen to him. Eric, maybe he can you help. You think he can help? You think anybody can? One thing's sure. That gun's not going to help you any... Come on now, kid, put it down. No. No, because nobody tells me what to do. Not when I've got a gun. They're afraid to. <laughs> That's right. They're afraid to. You're both afraid, aren't you? <laughs> it's nice. It's nice for somebody else to be afraid. I like that. I, I really like that. <laughs> he wasn't even looking at us anymore just somewhere off into space somehow Steffi sensed that I was waiting for a chance to grab his gun and motion for me not to and suddenly I remembered where I'd seen that lost empty look before Mrs. Palmquist, Eric's mother she'd had her share of that look the day she died <laughs> Mr. Dollar help me with him, please I picked him up, put him on the couch he had that terrible whiteness that a deep faint brings, and Steffi didn't waste any time. She loosened his collar, shoved his head forward. In a few minutes, he shuddered once, came to, took a deep breath. We made him comfortable on the couch, but you could see that it had been a rough trip for him. He was conscious, but he didn't have the strength to open his eyes. Steffi just stared at him. You'll be all right now. What's wrong with him, Steffi? Why that, that thing that just happened? You want the technical name? Circulatory liability. Sound impressive? Talk layman, huh? A form of extreme hypertension. Nerves. Enough to make him faint like that from anger, from fear. It's a lovely thing for a man to go through, isn't it? Well, that, that calls for a different kind of medicine, doesn't it? Analysis with a psychiatrist. He's in it now. Only with Eric, it's going to take a long time. Maybe a very long time. But a kid like that, how? Why? Fear. Overpowering, petrifying fear. Of what? His father. Of Dr. Palmquist? Yes. The nice Dr. Palmquist. The gentle, quiet healer. My employer. My father-in-law. You and Eric are married? Tijuana, six weeks ago. Eric is 25 years old, Mr. Dollar, and he's so afraid of his father we're still keeping the marriage a secret. Why, Steffi? Why is he so afraid of Palmquist? 
His analyst hasn't been able to get through to that. You expect me to? Well, somebody better. Why did you say that? Because he waved that gun around very convincingly for a scared kid. He never would have fired. Don't you understand? He's so frightened he couldn't have made himself do it. I hope you're right. I didn't think it was quite the time to mention one small fact. That if Eric Palmquist was incapable of pulling a trigger, it might turn out to be a very good thing for him. As the sole beneficiary of his mother's will, he would soon have $100,000 in a nice, tidy lump. And if he really was afraid of his father, a piece of money like that could take him a long, long way from the parental fold. In fact, no matter which way you turned, you couldn't get away from the logic that Eric Palmquist might be regarded by some parties as a first-class suspect in the death of his mother. Steffi was still pretty much upset when I finally left her, and I must admit that my own mind wasn't exactly at ease. Hoping that the fresh air would help to clear my thoughts, I took my time driving back, and it must have been nearly an hour later when I pulled into the subterranean garage of my hotel. I guess I was thinking too hard about what had just happened. In any case, I wasn't quick enough. Just as I passed one of the garage's big concrete pillars, a figure stepped out from behind it, brought the business end of a coat banging down on my head. The ground climbed up and got me. But not before I had a look at him. My heavy set, thuggy looking friend who tailed me earlier in the day. He could talk, too. You're in the wrong town, punk. Take the hint. I took the hint. I passed out. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a study in reactions. Three of them. One by a man who should know, one by a man who doesn't, and another by a bullet. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Thank you.